You good to go? Okay. Everybody sorry? All right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, class, uh, in-depth course about Palestine. Um, I'm kind of sick, so there will be a lot of coughing. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I see like uh, some of the Muslims here. Uh, may I ask, like, who's the? This is their first time to be inside of a mosque. Okay, got four people. All right, nice. Uh, you might want to like ask your Muslim brothers and sisters, like, where do we manufacture bombs in this mosque? <laughs> Okay, you'll get like my dark jokes in a while. <laughs> uh, so, without further ado, I'm just like gonna tell you how the uh, agenda for today will work, inshallah. And it will work as follows because we have about 15 minutes till Asr prayer, inshallah. Uh, so, we're gonna stop at Asr prayer and then uh, we're gonna start right after Asr around 4 um, at the latest, like 4.05. Right? And inshallah, the lecture will take place for like about one hour, one hour, 15 minutes until we have a Maghrib prayer. Uh, it's, we'll be praying at 5.25. And then we'll have, after the prayer, it will end about like 5.45. And after the prayer, inshallah, we'll have a, a refreshment break uh, for 15 minutes. And then we'll start again sharply at 6 p.m. for the second now for the second lecture, I'll be like uh, uh, concluding my first lecture and then the second lecture will start at 6.15 to 6.45 and then we'll have the Q&A section uh, from 6.45 to 7.30 inshallah till Aisha prayer. And of course we're gonna like pause when there is like an Adhan. Adhan is the call um, to prayer for Muslims. Uh, but we'll like conclude the session after we pray inshallah. Uh, so without further ado, I want to start with why does this matter to us? Um, there is a beautiful hadith. Hadith is the saying of our Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَدِّهِمْ وَتَرَحُمْهِمْ وَتَعَطُفِهِمْ كَمَثَلِ الْجَسَدِ الْوَاحِدِ إِذَا اشْتَكَ مِنْهُ عُضُ تَدَاعَ لَهُ سَائِرُ الْجَسَدِ بِالسَّهْرِ وَالْحُمَّةِ The example of the believers is like of that of a single body. If one organ complains, the rest of the body joins it in staying awake and developing a fever. And this is actually like the best example so for like why does this matter to us? It matters to us because like we're a single nation. Uh, even if you're a non-Muslim, like you can uh, still like feel the oppression. You can try to like to, to speak out or advocate for the oppressed people. Uh, but I mean like especially to us it feels personal for us as Muslims because like we have a bond There are like different types of bonds. There are like the, the, the blood bond Which is one of the strongest bonds that people like bond over uh, But there is also like the religious bond and because of this actually this is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa or technically the uh, the southern Masjid Al-Masjid Al-Qibli in the Masjid Al-Aqsa because the Masjid Al-Aqsa We'll have a, a display, inshallah, that shows you like where is the Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Uh, this is the uh, Masjid Al Aqsa is the first qibla. Qibla is where we pray. So right now we're facing this direction. It's the direction of Mecca uh, or Al Masjid Al Haram, the other uh, Masjid. But before we, uh, the Muslims, before we pray to this direction, we used to pray to this direction. It's the first qibla, and it's the third holiest mosque. Uh, for us as Muslims. Uh, the first one is the Al-Kaaba, where we pray right now. And then the second is the uh, Mosque of the Prophet وسلم, in the Medina. And then the third is this mosque. And it also is where uh, the, uh, the night journey of Rasulullah Al-Isra' Al-Miraj happened. It was right here. And it's a blessed land. Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi min al masjid al haram min al masjid al aqsa ladi barakna hawlahu. Glory be to Allah who uh, um, made his uh, uh, servant uh, make this night journey from al masjid al haram, uh, the Kaaba, to al masjid al aqsa, that we have blessed all around it. So this is the holy land. It's blessed all around. Um, and it's also another reason. And we believe that this will be Ard al-Mahshar, 
uh, the land where we'll be gathered on the day of judgment. So it's a holy land for many reasons for us as Muslims. And this is why, like, particularly why it's personal for us as Muslims. And also because there are oppressed people and we should advocate for the oppressed. We should advocate for those who do not have the same voices or cannot like voice out their opinions as much as we do. We are privileged and as you know, Uncle Ben says, with great responsibility, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. We have a privilege and we should use that privilege to uh, defend the oppressed. Uh, we'll start, as I said, inshallah, we'll start the historical background uh, right after the Salah. But let me just like give you uh, a context to uh, how are we gonna start. Uh, as I said, like this is the most important question that people ask all the time, like who has the moral claim to the land? Uh, it's a very complex issue and uh, some people like cite the 1948, some people go way back to uh, 3500 years ago. And for today, I'm actually willing to dig deeper. Um, inshallah, we'll be starting from Noah himself, the prophet. It's going to be a story, I'll tell you a story, the story of mankind, those who survived the flood, the greatest flood that hurt the earth, those who survived with, with uh, Prophet Noah. Uh, I can start. I'm going to have like five minutes, right? Yeah. To prayer? Take all the time. Yeah. Okay. We might as well start right now because we still have like five, five minutes to prayer, inshallah. So, uh, after the flood, Prophet Noah survived with uh, three of his uh, sons, Yafith, Sam, or Sham, and Ham. Uh, from Yafith came the descendants of like the maritime nations, Indo-Europeans, the Greeks, Mediterranean parts of Europe, like Turkey and, and above, like they um, inhabited like uh, north and west. And then comes uh, Sam. This is the, where the word Semitic is derived from, Sam, Semitic. And these are the descendants of, of Sam, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Hebrews, and Arabs. So, news flash to whoever doesn't know, Arabs are Semitic. We are Semitic, uh, if you're an Arab. And then Ham has uh, uh, the descendants of like Canaan who inhabited the Holy Land. Those were the first tribe to inhabit that part of the land, Canaan, uh, or Canaan. Uh, and then Mizraim, uh, those who were the tribe, were the people who inhabited Egypt. And then you have Kush, those are the tribe that inhabited uh, Sudan, South Sudan, and Africa. And then Fut, North Africa, Libya and North Africa. Uh, from Sam came Ibrahim. So Ibrahim is a, a, a son or one of the sons of Sam who is a son of Noah. And Ibrahim lived in Iraq, uh, modern day Iraq. He lived in Babylonia, in Babel, in Iraq. But as I said, it's the land of Canaan. Those were the first people to inhabit that piece of land. It was uh, Canaan and his sons. But there is a very important and very interesting uh, fact actually in the Old Testament, which is the Canaan's curse. Canaan was cursed. Uh, if you don't know the story, like uh, they say that he like uh, um, made Noah, made his father like drink some wine and like stripped him naked while he was asleep. And for that, when Noah uh, w uh, woke up, he cursed him. And I want you to read this. When Noah uh, awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son has, had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of his slaves, will he be to his brothers. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem, may Canaan be the slave of Shem. And may God extend Yafith's territory, may Yafith live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Yafith. This is very important, as I said, like Yafith is uh, uh, the son of Noah, that from him came the European nations, right? Uh, and here, I'll use that later, but here it says, uh, may God extend Yafith's territory. 
and may Yefeth live in tents of Shem, like it was okay for Yefeth to share, to share the land with Sam. But only Canaan is, is cursed. So Canaan is cursed, both of the other brothers are okay. Uh, uh, blessed the God of, of, of Sam, and Canaan shall be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. And based on that fact, that actually the uh, like that uh, the, the dissidents of, of Sam later on they conquered that piece of land the, the land of Canaan they conquered it and because they believe that this piece of land was theirs or it's promised to them by God because Canaan should not own any piece of land Canaan shall be only the lowest of slaves to his brothers. But Yafit is okay. Yafit can migrate, but not Canaan. Although like Canaan and the Canaan tribes were the first people to inhabit that piece of earth. Uh, so, before Canaan, how does this presentation go? Ah, okay, so we're still here. So as I said, like in the, in the handouts that you have with you, uh, I've written in the first page. I'm not sure if the pages are numbered or not. If they're not numbered, we'll try to amend that, inshallah, in the next uh, uh, sessions. In the first page, like I, at the bottom of the page, I say refuting the claim that this is the promised land for the Jews. And there's basically, like I laid out like seven uh, refutations there. Uh, you could like further uh, categorize them into two main categories the historical claim and the religious claim and this is why like I'm, I'm telling you the story of, of Sam and his sons uh, of uh, Noah and his sons to give you like a historical context that this was the land of Canaan uh, so historically speaking those were the first people to inhabit that part of, 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 of earth and it should be theirs right uh, so if you say that, uh, like, the Jews, they came before Arabs, and they of course did, but before them there were other people in that piece of land who were the Canaanites, or the Canaanites. And by that logic, like, if you extend that logic, you should give that, that piece of land to the, their dissidents. And interestingly enough, there was a study done uh, in 2017, I guess, in Lebanon, uh, they primarily focused on the Lebanese population and they compared the genetic markup of the Lebanese population to the genetic markup or the DNA that they have for the, uh, the Canaanites, the uh, children of Canaan. And they found like a, 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 a very like huge match in the DNA markup between the modern day Lebanese and uh, um, the children of Canaan. And it's safe to assume because the study was primarily focused on Lebanese, but this is called like the Levant area, Hashem. Uh, so it's safe to assume that, uh, that because like they all like share the same connections and share the same DNA, the Levant area, that whole part, Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, and Lebanon. Uh, so it's safe to assume that the closest people uh, to the dissidents of Canaan are the modern day Levant people. Lebanese, Jordanians, uh, Palestinians, and um, Syrians? Syrians. So that's the first argument here. The first argument is that the land belonged, and actually like if you read the Old Testament, you'll find like m m numerous occasions that it says the land of Canaan. When we talk about Abraham, the prophet, uh, the father of all the prophets uh, will say like he migrated or he went to the land of Canaan, land of Canaan. So they, they actually believe like no dispute, like no one disputes this, that it was the land of Canaan. And as I said, like you should give it back to the Canaans or the uh, dissidents of Canaan, which are the modern day Lebanese and Palestinians and Jordanians and Syrians. And as I said, like uh, the second thing is that, not here. The second, uh, second point I'm making is that the Israelites, or the children of Israel, they conquered that piece of land. Uh, so again, like, give it back to the Canaans. And then there is like an interesting fact, which is that people change their faith all the time. 
we have one minute to prayer, so I'll, I'll just like conclude here. We'll start, inshallah, after the prayer uh, from point three, and then I'll take you on a like a historical journey, inshallah, to tell you more about uh, the the history. Uh, again, like I would like to welcome you all. Thank you for for coming, and inshallah, we'll conclude after the prayer. Jazakumullah. Thank you. Assalamualaikum again. So, inshallah, we're going to be starting in the uh, next couple of minutes, inshallah. So, if we could have you all, everyone here. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, like I haven't introduced myself, like I should have started with that. My name is Ahmad Ahmad. I'm from Egypt, so excuse English. My English is uh, English is my second language, so uh, don't be fooled by the accent. I'll try to, I'm trying to like Im imitate you guys, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it comes out like the longer I speak the flaws come out so I hope you don't mind um, I'm a physician scientist by the way and in my spare time I'm an activist Inshallah, we'll be having the Q and A session at the end because, like, we're 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 pressed on time. Uh, but I think this is interesting. How many of you did know about like the Canaan's curse? <coughs> Show of hands. Right. It actually gets tricky, and I'll talk about this in a minute. It gets tricky because uh, Judaism is an ethno religion. It's, it's, it's not just like a religion, it's an ethnicity too. So it gets really tricky when people use like religious arguments for ethnic reasons. Inshallah. Uh, should I start? Noor? Yes, start. Okay. Okay, so Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salat wa Salam wa Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. Uh, I think I stopped at point three when I said that people change their faiths all the time. Uh, so, for example, as I said, like I'm from Egypt, and um, I'm like I'm Muslim. My grandfather is a Muslim. I'm pretty sure that my great 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 grandfather, maybe like the 17th grandfather, was a Christian, and maybe like before that there were pagans. Before that, there were God knows like who or what were they. But the thing is. People change their faith, not their indigenous rights. Like I'm always, I've, I've always been like Egyptian. My whole family, my lineage, they were all Egyptians. So even like if my great grandfather converted to Islam or his great grandfather converted to Christianity or whatever, they were still Egyptians. So nobody should like take their like indigenous rights that they belong to Egypt from them just because like they converted. People change their faith all the time. So the people of Palestine, the people of the Holy Land, they might have like converted from Judaism to Christianity to Islam or long before that or after that. So people change their faith all the time. That doesn't mean that they were like, uh, like a lot of, th that they were not uh, born in this piece of land. It, it, it doesn't mean that. There are, of course, like some migrations, like people migrate also all the time from one place to another. But the thing is, as I'm saying, like the indigenous rights of the people do not change based on their faiths. If they change their faith, it doesn't mean that they don't belong to this piece of land. Uh, and it's the, similar to the, the fourth point, which is what changes our political regimes, not indigenous rights. Uh, as I said, like regimes like get toppled all the time. People change their regimes. Like this uh, particular group uh, were ruling. At one point, actually, the Egyptians were ruling that piece of land. So it, it changes. Uh, Egyptians, then the Babylonians, the Romans, the Byzantines. It, it changes. The political regime changes, but the, not so much as the indigenous rights of the of the people. So these are basically like the historical refutation of that that land belonged to the Jews. It doesn't belong to them, it belonged to uh, the um, Canaanite people, the children of Canaan, Canaan. And by that logic, if we're like tracing the ancestors back to like where does it all start, or where did it all start, we're pretty much 
left with with Canaan and his children. So give it back to them. And the uh, second point, as I was saying, uh, uh, people change their faiths all the time, but not so much. And the political regimes change all the time, but not the indigenous rights. And then comes the religious um, claim. After I said, like, historically speaking, it's not the land of Jews. They, like, migrated, or they, like, the people of, like, that land converted to Judaism. But before them, it was not theirs. Like, we've established that, historically speaking. So where does this notion uh, come from? The notion that this is our promised land. It's a religious notion. And the easiest refutation to that religious notion is that Nobody believes what you believe in. It's just as simple as that. Like imagine if I tell you that, that uh, uh, Cincinnati is my God-given right. <laughs> like God gave me Cincinnati, for, for example. Do we just like roll over and give me Cincinnati? It doesn't work like that. So this is the easiest refutation to the religious claim. You should not impose your religious beliefs on others. However, because we're Muslims, we're religious people. Like I'm not a secular person. I'm a religious person. So I'll tackle that from a religious uh, point of view. Uh, we believe that land and everything belongs to God, the Almighty. In the, Lord, in the words of Moses, in, in the Quran, and it's like there are like similar verses in the Old Testament. In the Lord, the land belongs to God, the Almighty. And God gives it uh, to whomever He wills based on their righteousness. So if you're righteous, God will reward you with a piece of land. Uh, and uh, if you deviate from the teachings of the prophets, then it will be taken away from you. So basically we believe that all land, everything belongs to God Almighty. And yes, at one point, God gave it to the follower of Moses, who were the Jews, but then the who follows the prophets, right, like to this day and age, we will like say we're the Muslims. We are the followers, the true followers of, of, of the prophets. And I know like it gets tricky that people will like argue religion. And yeah, I, I know that we could like sit and, and talk about religion and argue and debate which is the right religion. But like we're saying, I'm, I'm saying that this is like a, a religious point of view, right? So I'm, I'm giving you my, t my two cents about like my religious point of view too. Uh, Also, we'll talk about in a minute, inshallah, that uh, maybe we'll talk about it now. Uh, it, was, it was promised that Moses told them, uh, go and take or conquer this piece of land that Allah or that God uh, promised you or gave you. But then they refused. They said, it has like giant warriors. We're not going to fight over there. We're not fighting. You go and you, you and your Lord, you go and fight. And this, this is why like, they were uh, punished by the lost at they were uh, they wandered lost in the, uh, in the Sinai desert for 40 years and during those 40 years Moses and his brother uh, Aaron or Harun they died the point is it was promised to you based on certain characteristics certain qualities that you've had or your ancestors had or should have had uh, uh, which is being righteous and following the righteous uh, way of, or the path of the prophets. When you do not, when you deviate from that, it's not yours anymore. It's taken away from you. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> uh, where are we going again? I don't want to take too much like uh, on that point, uh, but let me say one more thing about the uh, conflating the religion Judaism with the Israelites or the Zionists, uh, the political belief Zionism, uh, because as I said, like Judaism is an ethno religion. Ethno religion means that. Some people would identify as, as Jews or as Jewish people, or though like they're not practicing, or maybe they're atheists. For example, Theodor Herzl, the person who theorized that nation, national home for, for Jews, he was borderline atheist. He didn't believe in God. He was not a religious person. 
uh, although like he used religion because religion sells, he used it later on. And actually it was not theorized that at the beginning, uh, Palestine was never theorized to be like the, 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 the home for Jews. They, they talked about Argentine, Brazil, Uganda. And actually that would, would have been like quite the scene. Like imagine if Israel right now was in Uganda and you had like Uganda and Hamas. Uh, that's a scene to <laughs> um, So as I said, like it was never theorized that that piece of land should be like the home of the Jews. Uh, and as I said, like you have some Jews who identify as Jews, although they're not religious. But for them, it's an ethnicity. Um, I'm an Arab, this is my ethnicity. I'm also a Muslim, but there are like non-Muslim Arabs. Uh, but it's easy for us because like my ethnicity is not my religion. But as I said, like it gets tricky when we talk about Judaism because it's an ethno-religion. And this is why like we want to differentiate between the religion or the religious people. Actually, the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews, they believe in whatever I'm saying right now. They believe that uh, yes, it was their ancestors' land, but uh, they were punished by God, and God dispersed them amongst the nations, and they shouldn't go back uh, to uh, Palestine. Uh, at least, like, they have three promises in the Talmud. The Talmud is like their uh, uh, second holiest book after the Torah, the Old Testament. So, uh, they have three promises in the Talmud. The first promise is that uh, uh, you should not, like, force your way back to the, uh, the Holy Land. And the second promise is that uh, you should not like fight with the nations or cause like revolutions uh, within the nations. Uh, and if you do the first two, then uh, uh, the third promise will be uh, uh, given to you, which is no nation will like uh, uh, gather on you to like to wipe you off the face of the earth. These are the three promises that they believe in, and this is why like you have like uh, um, religious Jews who are opposed to the Zionist movement since the start of it, actually, not just like nowadays but I, I'm just like giving you the context the Hasidic people for example these are like a famous uh, uh, Orthodox Jews and they are like uh, pro-Palestine all the way and they are like anti-Zionists not because like they're self-hating Jews not because they're not Jews not because they're not Jewish enough they are but the thing is from a religious perspective, they're, they're, they believe that they shouldn't force their way back into the, uh, the Holy Land, and they only like go back. They should only like go back to the Holy Land after the return of Jesus. So, all faiths, all three faiths, were waiting for Jesus to come, and I guess like at least some of us will not be happy when he returns. Uh, but we are the Muslims. We too like we await uh, Jesus' return. Christians, of course, and this is why also like. I don't like talk religion so much here about, uh, uh, about other religions, I mean. But uh, you have like some Christians who actually believe that we're like, we're making the, the process go quicker if we just like give the Jews this land because they have a prophecy that this will like uh, make the return of Jesus like a lot quicker. Again, for religious purpose, nobody like, they don't... They don't care about the Jews or whatever happens to them. They don't care about them. But for them, it's a religious, like, they actually believe that they killed Jesus, those same people. But they're waiting uh, for Jesus' return, and they believe that this will happen if all the Jews, like, uh, go to Palestine. So as I said, like, uh, and this is my last point of refutation here, uh, Palestine was, was not even, like, in the earliest suggestions of which piece of land to give to the Jews. It was not. And Palestine was given to them for political reasons, pure political reasons. Uh, there is a term, uh, it's called the barrier state. Uh, uh, basically, it's, it's a strategic buffer zone. It's a puppet state. Uh, and it was first theorized, it's like one of the known strategies that Napoleon Bonaparte used to uh, do. Uh, like the um, Duchy of Warsaw, uh, it was like a strategic, it was this buffer state, this barrier state. It, it advances and extends your political influence by like uh, putting this state that um, you control in between like various uh, um, regions that are like, an, uh, like there are your enemies. So you put this like barrier state, a buffer zone, so that you make sure that they don't fight you again, or at least like it's hard for them. So again, like he theorized that Palestine should be our buffer state. 
it was like a colonial uh, colonial uh, era. Uh, it was uh, the Great Britain just like uh, defeated uh, the Ottoman Empire, and they wanted to dismantle the Ottoman Empire. And for them, again, like Palestine was like a political, a strategic a political point. And this is why, like, and they had like a Jewish problem, which is like the anti, the, the rise of anti-Semitism was real in Europe, not not in um, like in, in the Muslim world or in the Mediterranean world. Like, it, we don't, we didn't have a beef with with the Jews. They actually lived with us, like hand in hand in harmony. We don't have a problem with them, and they actually enjoyed throughout history. They enjoyed more religious freedom uh, under the uh, Muslim rulers more than they ever did under like any Christian rulers. And nobody disputes that. Again, like this is just like historical facts. Nobody disputes that. So as I was saying, and Brother Hamza, inshallah, will we'll talk about this at length in the next uh, lecture, that the idea of a barrier state. I just want you to remember that term, a barrier state. So Palestine was given to the Jews for pure political reasons. Uh, and as I said, like Theodor Herzl himself, he was not even a religious person. But he was like, you know what, religion sells, this would be like a good story to tell people that if we say that we have like a, a historical claim to that, like a, a moral claim to the land, our ancestors were there, it will sell. It's a good story to tell the Western world and the American people, to tell them that, uh, you know, our ancestors were there, we should go back, and they used religion. He was not a religious person, he was a borderline atheist. You can also like um, double check that. Uh, so as I said, like these are the easiest refutations to that moral claim that this land belonged to the Jews. Historically, no, it did not belong to you. It belonged to the people of Canaan and his uh, descendants. And those are the modern day Lebanese and the Levant area, uh, the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Jordanians. And um, also like people change their faiths all the time, political regimes change all the time, but not indigenous rights. And these are the historical uh, refutations. The religious refutation, as I said, like we could argue religion, but the easiest one is that don't impose your religious beliefs on others. And you have your religious beliefs, we have ours, so. Uh, and as I said, like Palestine was chosen for pure political reasons. <sighs> now let's go back to history. Uh, where do we go? So as I said, like Noah, uh, uh, son of Noah was Sam, and then uh, Ibrahim was one of the sons of Sam. Ibrahim, as I said, like he was uh, born or uh, lived in Iraq uh, the, at the earliest part of his life in Babel. Uh, and then he was ordered by God to migrate to Egypt where he uh, married uh, his second wife, uh, Hajar. And then he was ordered again like to move to Mecca uh, or the mountains of Paran in, in the Old Testament. Uh, he was ordered to like to go to Mecca where he uh, uh, like had his uh, first son, the older son uh, Ishmael or Is Ismail uh, and uh, they built the Kaaba. They were ordered to build uh, Al Kaaba, which is the first um, grand monotheistic place of worship on earth. Not just like, I'm not saying this because we're Muslims. I'm, I'm talking about Ibrahim, even before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the, again, like it was, uh, 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 God told him to build this place of worship and I will like gather nations to pray at this. And it's one of the miracles that actually already happened. Anyways, um, from Ismail came the Arab nations. And also there is a prophecy here that uh, Ibrahim was gonna be like the father of like a great nation. Uh, some people use it to say like the Arab nation. Ibrahim uh, uh, actually means in Hebrew, Ebra uh, means uh, father and Ham means uh, multitudes. So the father of many, many, uh, many people or multitudes, the father of many. Uh, and then he was ordered again to leave them, uh, leave Hajar, the mother of Ismail, and to return back to where, like, uh, the Holy Land. And on his way, he was ordered to return back. 
to like to go back to Iraq. But on the way, uh, God gave him, like told him to settle in uh, that holy land, which is nowadays Jerusalem, uh, where he had Isaac, the second son, uh, his uh, uh, first wife, Sarah, uh, she uh, uh, couldn't like uh, uh, have any children until like uh, uh, at a later point in, in, in her age. Uh, they had Isaac and then uh, uh, they were like in, in, uh, in the Quran, uh, they were like uh, surprised that I'm of old age and my husband is of old age. So how am I gonna like uh, have a son right now? And God uh, uh, promised them not only that they uh, have a son, that they will live until they say their uh, grand uh, ch uh, child, which is uh, Jacob. Jacob was later named Israel. Israel means the person who struggles uh, for the sake of God. Or Ail means that 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 uh, uh, suffix means God. Israel means the struggle. So is the person who struggles. Uh, Jews actually have a, a different interpretation of this, of the name. Anyways, I'm not going there. Uh, but I mean like Jacob was later on named Israel. And from Israel came the children of Israel. Twelve sons uh, came the twelve tribes who were like uh, the ancestors to the uh, Hebrews or the great, uh, the great like Jewish um, the tribes. And we know the story of, of Yusuf uh, and his siblings. They plotted against him, and no, we're still here. They plotted against him. They uh, threw him at the bottom of a well uh, until, like, a caravan came and uh, took him as a slave. Took uh, Yusuf as a slave, peace be upon him, and they sold him into slavery, like one after another, until like he uh, reached Egypt. And then we know the story, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, treated well uh, at the beginning in the, uh, the households of uh, one of the elites, the rulers, he was the treasurer of Egypt. And uh, we know the story again, like his wife seduced uh, Yusuf and then he ended up in jail, in prison. And then after prison, he uh, uh, got to, 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 to be the treasurer, the new treasurer of Egypt. Uh, and then he had power. Yusuf, Joseph, had power. And then the famine, this is actually the reason why like, he was elected, because he was um, uh, interpreting a dream of that king. And there was like, he told them, like he developed a plan, not just like interpreted the, the dream for them. He told them that there is like a strategic plan for you to like to survive that famine. And then the famine happened. It was a great famine that not only affected Egypt, it affected that region. Uh, but as I said, because of the strategic plan that Yusuf put, uh, Egypt survived, and not only that it survived, uh, it had like extra uh, like uh, uh, crops for the neighboring regions. And this is why like his brothers migrated from the Holy Land from Palestine to Egypt to get like supplies. And uh, they like later on like the um, uh, Yusuf Joseph confronted them, and they knew like he was like a king now or like a ruler, an elite ruler. Ruler. So he told them like enter Egypt uh, with uh, with the will of Allah, and uh, you will be safe. And as I said, because like he had such a, a high um, a position of power. Uh, his brothers, the 12 brothers, they all like, they lived in Egypt and they owned lands and they lived pretty good lives uh, for generations. Uh, but as like, you know, history and how it happens after generations, the Egyptians, they didn't like them because they were foreigners, so they enslaved them. And it was pretty bad for the children of Israel, or like their children, of course, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about like the exact sons of Jacob. I'm talking about like their dissidents. Uh, so they, uh, they lived like a miserable life in Egypt uh, until, the, uh, until Moses came. Uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, Moses was a strong man. 
And as I said, like they were born into slavery, like Moses himself was born into slavery. Uh, but he was Egyptian, by the way. He's a children of Israel and he's Egyptian. So again, like do not conflate the two together. Uh, anyways, Moses, uh, there was the story that uh, one of the children of Israel like got into a fight with an Egyptian and he was a weak because he's also a slave and uh, he asked Moses to like to defend him. So Moses just like got in between and pushed the other guy, but Moses was very strong, so the, the, the Egyptian guy died by that push. And then the very next day, the same thing happened. The, the same person, the same Israelite, the same uh, person picked up another fight with another Egyptian and then called on uh, Moses again like to defend him. And this is why like Moses told him in Nakada Mubin, like every day like you're gonna like get into a fight with people you cannot fight and you're gonna like call on me. So when Moses confronted him telling him this, the Israelite thought that Moses is going to attack him. So he screamed, he's going to kill me like he killed that person yesterday. He snitched on him. So basically they were like looking for the killer of the murderer of the person of the Egyptian uh, that uh, happened the day before and that Israelite uh, told on Moses and then another uh, Egyptian guy told Moses that you should run because they're gathering the people and they will kill you so Moses fled to uh, he, he ran until he reached uh, Median which is modern-day uh, Jordan he ran there like he ran from Egypt uh, um, to like the, the west bank of the uh, Red Sea until like he reached Jordan uh, and then he stayed there uh, in Median and we also know the story that there was like a, a, a will people were gathered uh, trying to like to, to pick up water but there were like two ladies who were waiting for the, the will to get less crowded to, to get water and then Moses because he's a strong man and he's uh, you know he had like multiple good qualities that chivalry so he went and helped them and then later they uh, uh, told their father about what happened and then their father like offered him a contract to marry one of his daughters and to work under him for eight years to ten years. Uh, some accounts are they say that the, the, this father-in-law was Shuaib and Nabi. Uh, I'm not sure his uh, English name. I think it's Jethro. I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, so Moses lived there for eight years or ten years, and then he went back to Egypt. And on the way back to Egypt, when he was in Sinai, uh, he received uh, the prophethood. There was the, the fire in Sinai, the fire that happens, and he told his, his family, just like, wait for me. Again, like, he's, he's a strong man, and he's very, uh, uh, like, he has this chivalry, and he, like, th saw this fire, and he th thought, like, people needed help, or, like, I'm gonna check it out. Like, they either help us, or they need help. So he went, and, like, he uh, talked with, with, with God, and he received his prophecy, and... Uh, uh, God sent him to the Egyptians uh, first of all to like to, to let them know about like worshiping only one God but also to uh, 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 like leave the Israelites do not enslave the Israelites anymore give them back to me and we're leaving Egypt we're gonna leave it for you but then we know what happened the Pharaohs they didn't very much like uh, uh, care about religion or about Moses and we know the story and we know what happened and then it was the great exodus the Pharaoh came after him came after Moses and his tribe uh, and as I said like they fled to the Sinai and the Red Sea and we know the, the miracle that happened and Bifallah thanks uh, Alhamdulillah uh, uh, praise be to, to God that Moses won over the Pharaoh and then as I said earlier that God told them to go and conquer that piece of land uh, uh, that God promised you the holy land but as I said like at the beginning they refused the Israelites they refused and uh, uh, they said like we're staying in Egypt and they were actually like very happy with uh, like settling in the desert of Sinai to like to uh, get uh, like more crops uh, the verse in Al-Baqarah 
آه قالوا ان نصبر على طعام واحد فدعوا لنا ربك يخرج لنا من تمت الارض من بقلها وقثائها وفومها وعدسها وبصرها. So they were saying to Moses that uh, we cannot just like live off like one type of food. We want to like because we, in Egypt like we used to have like lots of, uh, of, of foods. So uh, pray to your Lord to give us more and we're happy to settle here. We're not going to Palestine. We don't care about this. We're just like we'll be here. Uh, do, do you like uh, accept what's lowest and like uh, refuse what's what's better for you? Like live here and you'll have you shall have all the types of foods, all the crops that you uh, uh, enumerated. Uh, and as I said, like they were punished, they wandered lost in the uh, uh, the desert of Sinai for forty years. Uh, I'll try to go faster here. In uh, 40 years, uh, as I said, like Moses and Aaron died, and then the children of Israel, those Israelites, uh, had another uh, a prophet, Joshua, Yusha ibn Nun. He was the student uh, of Moses. قال لفتاه يعني in in the Quran there is a verse that Moses was talking to his like uh, word. Uh, and that, that person was Joshua. Uh, in the meantime, like I'm, I'm telling you here that, like the, about the prophets and whatever was happening in Sinai. In the meantime, during that time, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about like the specific years, but I mean like around the, the, same, uh, uh, the, the same area, the same years. Uh, there were people who were named the Sea People. Sea people because they were sailors, they were raiders, they used to like to invade uh, coasts. They were very good at like fighting uh, 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 in, the, in the sea. So, uh, sea people actually that's the, their description. The name is in Greek is Philistines. So that's the, the name. This is where the name Philistine or Palestine come from. The sea people. And as I said, like they conquered from the Aegean, uh, uh, from the Aegean uh, Sea, uh, so they are European. And if you still remember what I told you, the European people were the descendants of Yafith. I know that, uh, like, tracing back like ancestry to a single person is is very complex. So it's not like I'm, I'm oversimplifying everything here. But th the point is, they were European people, and they conquered the coastal part of the Mediterranean Sea. And as I told you earlier, that that part was under uh, 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 the ruling of Egyptians. So they had like multiple fights uh, with the Egyptians. And actually, we in Egypt, we have uh, like uh, in, uh, inscriptions that talk about this, the, like two fights, the battle of the Nile River and there's the battle of Dijai. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but the, the battle of Dijai happens actually in what's nowadays modern day uh, Lebanon. So the, the uh, ruling of the, that Egyptian dynasty like took over not just Egypt, they were ruling uh, like till Syria. So Syria and Lebanon and Palestine, it was uh, under Egypt. Anyways, that those the sea people, they uh, invaded that coastal part. Uh, the Egyptians defeated them, uh, but they also like they inflicted so like a, a great toll on the Egyptian army. So they weakened it. But anyways, like they ended up uh, residing in like five major cities. Uh, what's nowadays the modern day Gaza uh, and uh, Ashkelon, Asqalan and Tal uh, al-Safi, uh, I think it's, I'll have to get the, the name again because right, it's, 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 uh, it was called Tal al-Safi, but nowadays like it's a ruin uh, after w what happened in 1948. Uh, and anyways, like they stayed in five cities in Palestine, mainly like the coastal area of Palestine. Uh, and as I said, like this is where they actually uh, like mingled and intermixed with uh, uh, the the Canaanites. As I as I told you, that piece of land had people before them. They were the Canaans, so they lived with them. After they invaded them, they li they lived with them. So uh, at that point, you had the uh, descendants of Canaans and other like migrated uh, nations, and you also have the Sea people, the Philistines. We'll go back again to uh, Joshua. Or 
are we now? So Abraham came Ishmael, Isaac, then Jacob, then the siblings, we said this. And then we have Joshua. Uh, uh, in, in, as, as, as Muslims, we have a, a, a saying from the Prophet وسلم, hadith that says, Hadith عن بني Israel, ولا حرج, that uh, like you, you're allowed like to, to read the accounts of the Israelites. Do not like believe in them or like uh, uh, disbelieve in them until like you do your due diligence in like investigations. Uh, but uh, we don't have like lots of information. We as Muslims, we depend on our primary sources, uh, the Hadith and the uh, uh, Quran, of course. Uh, so we have a Hadith uh, on uh, Prophet Joshua or Prophet uh, Yusha ibn Nun. Uh, as I said, like he was, uh, like he received his uh, pr uh, prophethood in Sinai after the death of, of Moses and Aaron, and he tried to uh, call the Israelites again to the path of God, and some of some of, of, of whom like uh, of those people like followed Joshua, and then he told them we still have to go and fight that fight and conquer that piece of of, of land. Uh, uh, there were like three hundred and. Uh, like 310 people and they went and they conquered they had the the, the, the fight with uh, giant warriors Goliath he started the kingdom of Israel uh, came after him King Saul Saul is Talut uh, there's a story here but I'll try to go faster again uh, after Talut uh, Talut also like had a, another like other fights with the giant warriors and after uh, uh, Talut uh, came King David uh, uh, David uh, in the fight he killed Goliath uh, and he was a king uh, and uh, he was uh, like we believe uh, that uh, David or Dawood uh, we as Muslims, we believe that there were like four known uh, holy scriptures, uh, Quran revealed to the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Bible was revealed to Jesus, and um, the Torah, the Old Testament was revealed to Moses, and the Zabur, uh, or again, like I'm not sure the correct uh, pronunciation in English, but anyway, there is a book like we believe that the songs of David, it was revealed to uh, King David. Uh, and he was uh, instructed by God to uh, build, uh, oh, we didn't talk about, sorry, I'm going back to Abraham here for a second. We didn't talk about Al-Aqsa, sorry. Allahumma <laughs> sa'an. So, as I said, when Abraham migrated, when he left uh, uh, Hajar and Ismail and he went to Jerusalem, did I say this or I didn't? Um, I, I forgot. I didn't? I didn't. So he was ordered by God to, like, to, 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 to erect or to build another uh, place of worship, just like the one he did in Mecca, the Kaaba. He was ordered to, to build another. And actually, there are like accounts even in the Old Testament. It was not a temple per se. It was not a, a huge thing, a great structure, but like an altar. Uh, and he was in Jerusalem. So that's the quickest version. He built uh, a place of worship. Let's put it this way. He built Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, one of them. They built a place of worship. And that place of worship was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, but then, uh, because like generations after generations, they came, they were not really believers. And most of these prophets, they were sent to like to specific nations, not as Prophet Muhammad, who was uh, sent to uh, uh, mankind. They were like sent to specific nations. Anyways, uh, uh, after generations after Prophet Ibrahim and Isaac and, and Jacob, uh, came like other non-believers uh, communities, and that structure, that masjid, was demolished or destroyed or just like um, was not existent, like it didn't exist. So when King David uh, won that fight and established the kingdom of Israel right after this, he wanted to, 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 to erect another place of worship uh, uh, to thank, to praise the Lord and to thank the Lord for what happened. Uh, but then like, for 
anyways, he was not the, the person who built, like he, he knew like where should we build that, that place, but he didn't. He, uh, he was not the one who did it. It was Solomon, King Solomon, his son, uh, Suleiman, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallam, Suleiman, uh, or Solomon built that uh, place of worship again. It was like uh, greater, was more, again, like more formidable. It was larger. Uh, Solomon was uh, one of the four people who ruled over the, uh, the earth. He, he had like a huge kingdom, very huge kingdom. And he was a great king and he built that masjid again, which the Jews refer to as the temple, the uh, Solomon's temple. So it was built on the same, uh, what's the word here? Uh, what? Yeah, foundation, okay. Foundation of the Masjid al-Aqsa that uh, Prophet Ibrahim or Jacob or Isaac built. But he is the one who built like, uh, that, that great uh, temple. Anyways, after Solomon's death, don't mind a little animation. Uh, so after Solomon's death, the kingdom got, uh, became like weaker as, as what happens. And it was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, and they took a capital of it, uh, Nablus, modern day Nablus. It was uh, named uh, Shekin. Uh, and then uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, and they took a capital of Jerusalem. So the kingdom of Israel was in the north, right? And its capital was Nablus. The southern kingdom was the kingdom of, uh, of Judah. Uh, Judah is one of the, the sons, these are the, the, the sons of, of, of Jacob. And uh, as I said, like, there were like 12 tribes, uh, 10 of them, 10 of them, 10 of them, uh, they like got together and they migrated or they built, they were like divided amongst each other and they had the northern kingdom, 10 tribes. And the other uh, two tribes had Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin uh, is, or Benjamin is the youngest brother of Yusuf. And they established, not, not the, the, the brother himself, but I mean like the tribe. They, they established the southern kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem. And then came the Assyrians. And if you remember again, like the Assyrians were um, uh, uh, descendants of, of Sam part of the Semitic people uh, and they conquered uh, the northern kingdom of Israel they massacred it was it was it was bad they massacred like thousands thousands in, in a single day and they destroyed the northern kingdom and then after them I'm talking like centuries after them came the Babylonians and the Babylonians uh, invaded the southern kingdom of Israel and it was Again, like it was a very bloody campaign. Uh, I want you to remember that name, the Nebuchadnezzar, the Nebuchadnezzar, the Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, if you remember the matrix, that was the name of the, the ship that Morpheus uh, used. The Nebuchadnezzar. I, I don't know why like they used that name, the Nebuchadnezzar. But anyway, that man, he was a tyrant. Like he killed 70,000 people in a single day. And he destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple, the masjid. Uh, but also, this is the person who uh, founded the Hanging Gardens of Babel. So, you know, politics. Like, he did that also. Like, he built one of the uh, uh, old seven wonders of the world, the Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the second. After him came Cyrus, he was Persian. Uh, they had, because the Nebuchadnezzar actually, this is a good story, uh, when he like uh, um, persecuted the Jews or the Jewish community, uh, and as I said, like killed 70,000 people in a day, they fled and they tried to, to, they got dispersed and they tried to like to, to, to go as far away as they could. And some of them actually ended up in Mecca and Medina, especially Medina. And why did they choose Medina? in like uh, Saudi Arabia. Why do modern day Saudi Arabia? Like why did they choose Medina? Because they have uh, prophecies in, in the Old Testament about the prophet that will come at the end of times. He will be the final messenger. They have this, I could show you the verses. They have uh, this and actually uh, one of the verses says that he will be uh, from his brothers. 
from his brothers and he will come from the, uh, the mounts of Paran. The mounts of Paran, Gebel Faran, are where actually Prophet Ibrahim lived and where Ishmael, and they have also another verse that talks that Ishmael lived in the mounts of, of Paran. Uh, anyways, they, they believe that uh, or, uh, or they have a prophecy that they will fight of the disbelievers with this prophet, they will kill everyone, and then they will rule again. That was the prophecy or their interpretation of the prophecy. Uh, they were actually asking the, uh, the pagans in uh, uh, the Arab uh, uh, peninsula, they were asking them about, did you have like another uh, person who claims to be a prophet? Because they were waiting for him. Generation after generation, they were waiting for Prophet Muhammad But when, when Prophet Muhammad came to them, they like rejected him and they said, uh, uh, like I mean, different stories, like they rejected him for different reasons. One of them, like, was uh, they asked him like three questions in Surah Al Kahf, and when the Prophet uh, responded to them, they told him, "Great, like we should be Muslims now." But uh, who is the 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 angel that uh, uh, brings you the revelation? And Prophet Muhammad said, uh, "Jibril." or Gabriel, and they said, this is our enemy from the angels, we're not following you. That was one of their reasons, at least for like one tribe of the Jews who didn't follow the Prophet Muhammad. Anyways, uh, as I said, like they flew, uh, they fled uh, all over the, the, the area. They were trying to, to get away from this person. It was called the Great Babylonian um, Asr captivity, I guess, like he, he took like so many prisoners for them and killed so many other people. This is why like they fled. They went, as I said, like to Mecca and Medina and they went up north. They went to Babel again in Iraq and they went to like modern day Iran. Uh, then came the King uh, Cyrus. Uh, King Cyrus was like a softer version and he wanted actually, he didn't want the Jews to live with them in Persia. So he was like, you know what, I don't very much care about uh, like the Holy Land or whatever, Jerusalem. So I'm allowing them to go back because I don't want them here. He didn't want them there in Persia, so he allowed them to return to Judah. So uh, they rebuilt the masjid again, and that was the, around the same time uh, where Jesus, peace be upon him, was, was born. And his uh, cousin, John, John the Baptist, uh, John is Yahya. Yahya ibn Zakaria. There is actually a hadith we have about, about uh, John, about uh, Yahya. And as I said, like, I try to mention these hadith because these are like primary sources for us as Muslims. Uh, he gathered all the, uh, the nations, all the people. Um, he was like, a, uh, again, he was a soft person, soft spoken person. And uh, he was older than Jesus, uh, of course. And he was, um, God gave him like uh, five commandments to uh, tell the people, but uh, he was reluctant. Uh, so Jesus came and told him, oh, my cousin, God gave you like five uh, uh, commandments to like to deliver to the people and you didn't. And if you don't, I will. But then John replied to him, if you do this, you know that I will be punished because like I haven't done my part. So gather everyone and I'll tell them about the five covenants. This is a hadith actually in the Sahih. Uh, and they gathered everyone until the masjid was uh, like very crowded. People like sat on top of the, like the buildings outside. Very much to like, uh, this is the masjid behind you if you want to see it. And masjid al-Aqsa, this is of course the modern day masjid al-Aqsa. And uh, sometimes during the salah, the night prayer in Ramadan, you see people because it gets very crowded. You see people like uh, praying on top of like, even like uh, the, the, uh, the outsider gates, they, uh, they pray on top of the gate. Uh, so it was like a similar uh, uh, scene gathered everyone. I'm just like mentioning this hadith because it talks about al-Masjid, al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, so the uh, people were gathered and John delivered the five commandments and then the hadith is a long hadith. The Prophet ﷺ then uh, tells them and I have like uh, other five, ten commandments for you. Anyways, uh, we know what happens. That, uh, like John was killed, unfortunately, and then uh, there was like a, a, a conspiracy against Jesus uh, to kill Jesus. Uh, 
I don't want to get into the details of this, but it's very interesting, maybe uh, like for another time. Uh, because the, 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 let me say this. I don't know how it will come off, but the, uh, the rulers around that time of Jesus and John, uh, some of them converted to Judaism. And for them, Jesus was a blasphemous. Um, again, like these are the Christian interpretation, of course. Um, topic for another day, inshallah. Anyways, uh, after Jesus, after Jesus Christ, uh, came the Romans. Uh, not after him, like the Romans were the rulers, uh, but I mean like uh, came like a specific king, Titus, and he destroyed everything. He destroyed Jerusalem, he destroyed uh, uh, Jerusalem, and he destroyed the masjid for the second time. Uh, we said the first person who destroyed the masjid was the Nebuchadnezzar, the second, and the second person was Titus. Again, it was a very bloody day, killed like thousands of people during that day, destroyed Judah again. And it was like a very uh, challenging times for uh, uh, the Jewish people after that. And they kept like fighting the oppression, fighting the power. They kept uh, like making revolutions. History repeats itself, it's kind of ironic, Allah. So they made uh, the Bar Kukhba uh, revolt. Um, they were killed against the oppression of the rulers, the uh, Titus and the Romans after him, until came this man here, Hadrian, um, he was also like another tyrant and he uh, defeated them and he suppressed this re revolution and killed also like thousands of them and expelled them and did two like uh, uh, new things here, like two uh, different like strategies. Uh, the first thing, he destroyed Jerusalem and he wanted to build another city on top of it uh, gets tricky just like pay attention because again like history repeats itself why was he doing this he, he tried to like to remove any connection uh, that the Jewish people had to this land so what's the brilliant idea we're gonna like kill them all displace them and build another city on top of it and we'll change the name of that city and he named it Ilya Capitolina uh, Ilya and actually the masjid also was destroyed but uh, in other accounts, like like way afterwards, it was called the Masjid of Ilya, Masjid Ilya, in, even in like in the, in the books of Muslims, uh, until like Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, conquered it. We'll talk about this in a, in a minute. Anyways, he built a new city, and he named the, the province, the whole province, he named it Syria, Palestina. Uh, why he added? He 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 just like they were like uh, established uh, uh, a strong uh, uh, Roman. Uh, um, province which was Syria uh, and he wanted to add that part of the, the piece of land the holy land he wanted to add it to Syria to just like suppress any movement or any revolution that could ever happen because like we have a strong uh, uh, state in Syria strong Roman state so he named the whole province Syria uh, Palestina and he used the, the name uh, Palestine again like he was trying to like to remove any connection that because before that it was commonly referred to as uh, uh, the land of Judah because that the people who were lived there they were Jewish people so uh, uh, it was called the land of Judah and he wanted nothing to do with with the Jewish community so uh, he named it Ilya Capitolina and he forbade Jews from entering the city not not even like visiting so much as visiting no, nothing he uh, banned them from entering the city uh, after Hadrian came, Constantine the Great, uh, Constantine Azim, Constantine converted to Christianity when he was like in his 30s, early 30s or late 20s. He converted to Christianity, and um, before before Constantine the Great, the Romans they were pagans and they didn't very much like any of the religions. Not Jews, not Christians. They didn't like anyone. They killed them all. It was it was very challenging for even the, the Christians there. But when Constantine the Great, when he converted to Christianity, uh, he built the Church of Sepulchre, Canis al Qiyamah. Uh, he built it in, in Jerusalem and he again he wanted to divert all the attention away from the masjid the temple to the new holy 
place, which is the church, the church of sepulcher. So he actually transformed or turned the, the masjid or the temple into a dumpster. Uh, that's the Constantine the Great. And he continued the policy of banning the Jews from, from the city. Like, he didn't care very much about the Jews. And this is why, like I'm telling you, like, the Jews, they enjoyed religious freedom uh, under the Muslim rulers better than whatever, like, other Christians or other, like, uh, pagans or whatever uh, rulers. Uh, and he desecrated the masjid, as I said, and he turned it into a dumpster. And then, alhamdulillah, after Constantine the Great came the uh, Muslim conquest, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he uh, uh, conquered the, the city, uh, first thing he did was he reclaimed the name of Jerusalem. Not Ilya, Capitolina anymore. It's going back to Jerusalem, Urshalim, Al-Quds. Uh, because this is how we have it, like in our uh, Muslim texts, we have the name Al-Quds. And he allowed the Jews to return. That's the first thing that he did, Umar ibn Khattab. In his, uh, the Pact of Umar, he made a, a pact of, of the, uh, like um, a covenant or a treaty or, I don't know how to translate, pact, it's a pact, it's in English. <laughs> so he made a treaty with uh, Christians. Uh, uh, Anyways, he made that, that back to with them. It, it was like, uh, we'll give you like, uh, uh, your churches will be safe, your uh, households, anything that you own will be safe. You can like still uh, exist and nobody's forcing you to like to leave the city. And uh, everyone is gonna like uh, 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 live in harmony together, the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, and this is what happened actually. And you can like just like search the Pact of Omar or Omar, uh it has another name in English, I'm not sure. And anyway, just like Google the Pact of Omar and read it, it's, it's very uh, interesting. And the, the important information that I want you to, to know that he allowed the Jews to return. They were banned by the Romans and he allowed them to return to Egypt because actually the prime minister that murders a uh, uh, criminal, uh, Netanyahu, he was in a, doing an interview with Jordan Peterson uh, six months before the, that, the ongoing uh, war. <coughs> And he was uh, saying that uh, the Jews lived for in, in, in this uh, piece of land for centuries, 3,500 years, and nobody ever in the history expelled them except the Muslims in the seventh century. That's absolute lie, absolute lie. Even like, like even Jewish people wouldn't like dare to, to lie that like blatant lie. It was exactly the opposite. Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Titus, and who destroyed the temple then? Long before the Muslims, who did that? Uh, and it was actually quite the reverse. It was Umar ibn al-Khattab who allowed them to return to, to the, the Holy Land. Uh, there is also like, well, it has so many uh, uh, lessons here about Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was, um, <coughs> Uh, the Muslims, the, the leader of the army, the captain was Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, another uh, famous uh, Sahabi. He was a great person also like we should talk about him. Anyways, uh, when he like uh, sieged the, the, the city, they sent for, for Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah and they told him, we'll surrender under one condition, that we make a deal with uh, the, head, your, the head of the state. So Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah like, came to them because he was the head of the army and they said no, we, we're talking about the head of the state, not just the head of the army. So he sent, he was, this, this is like Jerusalem, and he sent to Umar ibn al-Khattab who was in the Medina. And it took about like three or four days for Umar ibn al-Khattab, just like when uh, the, the uh, messenger came to Umar ibn al-Khattab, like immediately he took his horse and, and went. And he took his, uh, uh, his word with him, uh, al-Khadim, and uh, they were taking turns. This is Umar ibn Khattab. They were taking turns on the horse because they had only one horse and they were like traveling like uh, uh, worth of like one week or seven days, something like this. And they were taking turns on the horse. Although like Umar ibn Khattab is the head of the state and the other person is just like a servant. But they were taking turns. And right at the gates of Jerusalem, it was the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the turn of his servant to be on top of the uh, of the horse, and Umar ibn Khattab was the one who's, you know, like uh, uh, just like uh, holding the what's the again? Reins, yeah, the reins of the horse. Uh, so Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, when he just like saw him from afar, he's like, is this Umar ibn Khattab? What are you, and he ran to him and was like, 
what are you doing? And Umar ibn Khattab was actually like wearing his uh, like day-to-day -day clothes. He was not uh, uh, an extravagant person. Uh, so his, uh, his clothes were like torn, had some uh, torns. And uh, Abu Abed al-Jarrah said like, you're coming to, like, to, to meet with the head of another country and they are the Romans and like, couldn't you just like, uh, like war something different or like be uh, the, the one on top of the horse like what are you doing like these people are not gonna like give you the same respect and Umar ibn Khattab like got angry at Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah and told him the famous sentence if someone else said it to me I would have like whipped them we are people who uh, Allah Azza Jal privileged us or honored us with this religion if we try to like to seek honor from anything outside of, of this religion of Islam, Allah Azza wa will humiliate us. It's Allah Azza wa who gives us honor or He punishes us with humiliation. It's not our clothes. And, and this is Umar ibn Khattab. And then uh, he went and made that deal with uh, the Pope or the Patriarch. He was name, his name is, uh, was uh, Sifranius, I guess. And uh, after Sifr News made that pact with Umar ibn al-Khattab, this is also like uh, another, uh, Wallahi listen, um, Sifr News, like, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab was, was a very big man. He was, he was big, he was tall, he was, uh, had white shoulders. And they had like a prophecy in their uh, interpretations of the, the Bible. They had a prophecy that, that the land will be taken from them by a man in the, in the same belt of Adam. So when they saw Amr ibn Khattab, he was a big man, tall guy, uh, white shoulders, they like prostrated to, to him. And then the uh, servant of Amr ibn Khattab was like, what are you doing? Like, we don't do that. What are you doing? He's just like another man. And we do not prostrate except to, to God. And then the uh, Sifranios, the patriarch, when he saw this, he went to the corner and, and, and whipped, he, he cried. And Amr ibn Khattab was like, why are you crying? Just like, take it easy. It's just... Uh, you know, it, this happens like uh, uh, you lose your, your, your power, but then you gain it again. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab is saying this to the man that he just like uh, 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 made a, a pact with him. He's just like consoling him. And the guy said, do you think that I'm suffering news? He said, do you think I'm crying because I lost my throne? It's not. I only thought that you were like an, another uh, invading nation. That you're just like here to, to just like take over that place for a couple of years and then will come another invaders and kick you out. But what, what, after what I saw and how you like, how, how just you are and how, uh, how formidable you are, uh, I realized that your nation uh, is, is here to stay. And this is why like I'm crying. Because they knew like from that moment, this holy land will belong to those people. Uh, anyways, there are many lessons to be taken from here, but I just like wanted to stress on these two facts. After Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, al-Khilaf al-Rashida, and after what happened came al-Khilaf al-Umawiyah, they rebuilt the Dome of the Rock, uh, this one right here behind you. The Dome of the Rock is the uh, Masjid Qubbat al-Sakhra. And it's where Umar ibn al-Khattab made the, uh, the pact uh, with, with them. And it has many, many uh, significance. Uh, it, it, I'm talking about the specific Dome of the Rock. It's part of the Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is, if you, uh, if you look at the second display, this is everything here in the second display is Al-Aqsa. Uh, anyways, after the Umayyad, or Al-Dawla Al-Umawiyah came, uh, the Abbasid, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it the right way in English, Al-Khilaf al Abbasiya. Uh, they were like uh, focusing on expanding the Muslim territory uh, to the uh, Central Asia and East. So there were just like, not like a very significant things to be said here. And then came the uh, Dawla Al-Fatimiyah. Dawla Al-Fatimiyah was not a caliphate, it was just like, um, a state that ruled over like uh, some countries, not the whole thing. And uh, during their time, uh, they were actually like living uh, 
the coexistence with with uh, with the Jews and the Christians it was it was it was going good uh, of, of course it, like it had some t some tensions but like nothing 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 significant here uh, until the first crusade it happened and they took Jerusalem from them it started in uh, uh, 1095 Pope Urban called for it. He is the first person to call for the crusade, and he was like, we have to take that land back from the Muslims. Uh, he's a Christian, of course. And then it, really, it happened in uh, 1099, Jerusalem was captured, and it was, again, very, sorry, long time. It was very bloody, and they killed uh, lots of Muslims. Uh, After him, like in the 12th century, came subsequent uh, crusades. They expanded, and they not not only like they took Jerusalem, they took Lebanon, and they took the, they took the whole area. The crusades, but during that time, Muslims were reunited. Uh, and there was like a, a, a just man, a just ruler, Nuruddin Mahmud Zenka. I want you to remember that name. Uh, he was the mentor of this man, Salah Din. Of course, this is not the real de depiction of Salah Din. It's just like a, a, like a picture that I found on the internet. Uh, Nuri Din Mahmoud Zinki was the mentor and the ruler before Salah Din, and uh, they were uh, trying to like to, to, to fight off the Crusades, and they also like they fought in Egypt. He 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 ruled over Egypt, Syria, and Egypt. Uh, Nur al-Din Mahmud, and after him came Salah al-Din, and Salah al-Din, Salah al-Din also like ruled in Egypt, mainly, and Syria. Uh, what's to say here? Uh, Nur al-Din Mahmud like built a member, uh, you know, where we do the, the khutbah. He built one specifically for Jerusalem, so that when Muslims take back Jerusalem, inshallah, he would be the one, like he had this belief that he'll be the one, that it will happen in his lifetime and he'll be the one who gives the first khutbah. He died before that happened, but when uh, Salah al uh, uh, like uh, recaptured Jerusalem, he sent for that member to be, uh, 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 to, 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 to get it from Syria and they prayed on it. Uh, however, they didn't pray, like they recaptured Jerusalem, I guess in, uh, on th Thursday, and they couldn't pray uh, Jum'a. Ah. Jum'a ah is our congregational prayer. The, we, we, the Muslims, they couldn't pray the, the very f um, uh, following Jum'a ah because the masjid was desecrated. As I said, like the Romans couldn't care less about the masjid. And they were actually doing it not despite the, the uh, before them. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like before Umar ibn al-Khattab, they were doing it despite the Jews. And they wanted the, the attention to be reverted to, sorry, I have to go easier than that. Um, so they couldn't care about the, the, the masjid. And after uh, uh, the crusades, they w went to, to like to, they, uh, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, they, uh, I forgot, subhanAllah. Um, what are we saying? Yeah, they desecrated the mosque, they desecrated the masjid, the masjid al-Aqsa, despite the Muslims and the Jews. Because like the Christians, they, they don't really worship in that uh, area, but they worship in the uh, church, the uh, Church of Sepulchre, Christ al-Qiyamah. Uh, Another interesting thing, uh, Salah didn't won the Battle of Hattin, of course, like again, like Google it, Google everything that I say and just like learn more about it. I'm trying to go quickly here because like we have like 10 minutes to prayer, inshallah. Uh, and I have like to wrap up like, what? Four or five centuries. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so in the Battle of Hattin, he won uh, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, and uh, he also like besieged the the city, uh, the holy city, not not all of Jerusalem, just like the you know like the Vatican. It was it was like this. So he besieged the, that area, and they sent to, for, for him like to, to make like a, a peace treaty with with Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, and his uh, his initial reaction, he was very angry with them because the the Crusades were very bloody. They killed Muslims left. And right not only like when they were like recapturing Jerusalem they were like doing campaigns uh, to kill Muslims even like the the, the, the pilgrims the people who were like uh, going to to, to 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 Mecca to do a pilgrimage from that area from Syria Palestine they were like raid them they were like attack them and kill them all and w w uh, at one instant it was uh, 
uh, the sister of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi in one of those uh, uh, attacked uh, caravans. Anyways, so it, his initial reaction was like, I will give them the same peace that they give the Muslims when they recaptured the Jerusalem. They killed 30,000 Muslims in one day. Five minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, inshallah. Uh, Anyways, after uh, Salah al-Din came the Third Crusade, Richard the Lionheart, you know, there are like, I guess, two movies about him. He, uh, he failed, like he didn't recapture uh, Jerusalem, but then they did the Treaty of Ramla. It's also like a very interesting piece of, uh, uh, like, moment in history, read about it. So this that was the Third Crusade. After them came the Mamluks, another uh, uh, state, another uh, ruling parties, and at that time there were like the Mongols, uh, Tatar, uh, and they attacked the Muslim nations. They killed uh, close to two million Muslims in, in a single day. Well, it's just like trying to, uh, in Baghdad. Uh, so the Mamluks defeated them in Ain, the Ain Jalut. Uh, and then they also like defeated the Crusaders. I'll try to go faster here. Came after them the Ottomans. Uh, inshallah, like uh, in the second lecture, Brother Hamza will talk more about about uh, the Ottomans, especially like late uh, 18th century to uh, early 19th century, uh, and to right now, to whatever happened. Uh, inshallah in the second lecture. Anyways, the Ottomans, the Ottomans, al uh, Uthmanian, they rule from the uh, 16th century to the 19th century. Uh, there's so much to be said here, but anyways, like the, the, the first king, he declared, he defeated the Mamluks, and he was like um, more of a, like a nationalist person, he wanted to to uh, uh, take the Khilafa or the Caliphate, the Muslim Caliphate, to Turkey, uh, because like they, they had like beefs with Arabs for different reasons, and they wanted like the uh, Turkey to be like the ruling part of the Muslim uh, nation. And uh, the, from the 16th to the 18th century, it was uh, uh, an area of stability, alhamdulillah, uh, for two centuries. And then in the 19th century happened al Tanzimat. There were like organizations that uh, really like didn't subscribe to the notion of uh, Khilafah or Caliphate and they wanted to uh, get rid of it. And uh, they wanted everything to be just like, you know, uh, national, like Turkish. And w why should we like, because they had the strongest army because they were the, the center of the Khilafah. So they were like, why should we like go and, and help other nations or fight other nations? Uh, we should like, uh, this is like the Turkish army, and then you had Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and then the Ottoman Empire was weakened, and during that time they had to, uh, because they were weakened, so they were very weak, they had to like to look for, for like uh, allies. Unfortunately, I don't know like wh why would they do this? The only ally that they could uh, have at that time was uh, German. Germany and they made like pact with them. Uh, they didn't really have a choice. They were like, uh, as I said, like they were weaker and they wanted like to get like uh, weapons and and uh, to advance. But uh, uh, not Britain, not France, the uh, greatest power powers at that time. They didn't help the Ottoman Empire because it was like a rivalry between them. So he went to uh, the Germans uh, and the Germans. Um, told him like we'll uh, rebuild your your army but on one condition you have to fight with us and they f fought with them in the world war one and we know what happens germans lost uh, ottoman empire lost with them and after that uh, britain and france uh, uh, just like, you know, the site speak of Pico happened, the agreements, and they, they, they try to like to, to divide and take pieces of the, of the land. You'll take Palestine, I'll take Syria, you'll take Lebanon, and this is what happened. Uh, and of course, the, the Arab nations, ever since that moment with Sharif Hassan and whatnot, uh, there was like a rise of Arab nationalism. Like if we're gonna be Turkish, we're gonna be Arabs, and they started, and this is why like the Ottoman Empire was weakened, and it was lost. And as I said, like inshallah, in the next uh, uh, session, Brother Hamza will talk in detail uh, about uh, 
the earliest uh, 20th century and the late 19th century, inshallah. And he'll talk about all of this. I should conclude here, alhamdulillah. How long do we have till Maghrib? Okay, alhamdulillah. We'll have the Q&A's like a dedicated session after the after uh, the second lecture, but since we have 10 minutes, if you have like questions, we could have Q&A's right now. If you have any questions, that you. If you don't have any questions, we could like have them like an early, I've been speaking for one hour and some time, so <laughs> it's up to you. Like if you have any questions, I can take the questions. Go ahead. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Titus. What? <laughs> Titus. Yeah, right. Yeah, how he, um, he expelled Jews and killed a lot of Jews and stuff. Right. Uh, like, what was their reasoning for, for, for killing Jews and expelling Jews at that time? Okay, so Titus was uh, like a Roman king, and the Jewish community or the Jewish people, they had a beef with the Romans for different reasons, religious reasons, uh, political reasons. They had a beef with them, and Titus came after the Nebuchadnezzar II, came after him. So uh, after the Nebuchadnezzar, as I said, like he uh, expelled the Jews. Uh, uh, so the, whoever was left tried to, like, to revolt against the Romans, the Roman Empire at that time. So there was like um, tensions and clashes through generations. So when Titus came, Titus was a tyrant king and he was like, I've had enough with these people. I'm gonna do like worse atrocities than the Nebuchadnezzar. I'm gonna like make whatever Nebuchadnezzar did to them which is like a, a, a walk in the park. And he did like a worse atrocity actually, Titus. Did this answer your question? Okay. Do you have any other questions? Well, if you don't have any other questions, we can conclude here. Inshallah, I'll give you like a, like maybe less than 10 minutes to just like relax, do some stretches. Inshallah, we'll pray al Maghrib. Uh, uh, and after Maghrib, we'll have uh, the refreshment break. We could. Uh